देंगे Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the video game, Mr. Strumpet, Tony Norris. The daughter finished secondary last year. My what, daughter. Your daughter. How yes. many kids? you got two. I've got two, yeah. And She's that's 18. It? Okay. That's, yeah, that's it. That's it. How fast did 18 years go, though? Well, maybe for you. Yeah, because when I worked with you, you weren't married. You no, had no children. I never got married. And or you never you, you just had yeah you did you had a lot of sin because <laughs> <laughs> Woodstock started in 1995 when Joe opened it up yeah and I remember I was very ill and I couldn't actually get to the studio a lot so I used to just you know occasionally drop in when I used to feel okay and yeah, do right. some cleaning. I didn't you were so. I was I was rat shit, mate. I was uh, I was in hospital for months on end, you know, and I'd come out and do a couple of days' work and then go back to hospital and I stuff. Never knew that. Yeah, I was pretty fucked. But I, you know, the, the period I remember is when you'd cut my hair once every couple of weeks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have, you, have you ever had his? Ever had him cut your hair? Yeah, he's he's good with the scissors. I used to be. Well, there's only once you nicked my ear. Yeah. <laughs> Bled like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you remember that? Yeah, yeah. Well, he was kind enough to allow me to do that. Yeah, 95. That was a hard year. And that then went into 96 and right up till October, November, I was working at the beach house. Do you remember the beach house? Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I thought I was going to be a barista was it, wasn't that, at that stage. Wasn't that Mickey's part of the deal and... No, it was uh, Paul Hester. Paul Hester's wife. No, it was Paul Hester, and Joe. Joe. But those, and there was this other guy who ended up opening up another cafe called the Milk Bar, which was a, now yeah on the corner corner of, of in Elwood somewhere village. There. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can't remember his name though, but he was the main guy who had the hospitality background. So oh. two musicians and I a thought, hospitality. Uh, the, boy, the guys always told me Paul and Joe always told me they just bought that place to. Get the, the girls off their back. They did, but both those women, unfortunately, no offence, had no idea how to run the place. No, of course not. No. So um, when I went there... Hester, hey? Wow. Paul yeah, I, yeah, I know. And, I, you know, this is the weird thing. Before he passed away, I, re I went down to the St Kilda Baths and it was a wintry... Mon it was Monday or a Tuesday or something like that and I, w and I was having some personal issues and I just wanted to have a massage and I, and I got booked into the um, St Kilda Baths and it was a very overcut. Have you ever been to the St Kilda Baths? Yeah. Because as you wait in the waiting room, you can actually see the bay. Yeah. And so you've got the bay and really dark, wintry skies. And I saw this guy just peering at the window, dressed in black, but I remember he had all those rings on his fingers and I always find people, men, who have those... Ruby uh, rings on their hands, quite interesting because I'm, I'm not sure, I don't know, I just find them intriguing because yeah, yeah. the colours are there and they've got them on each finger. And I didn't pick up who he was because he had the dark glasses and a hat wow. and he just peered out and I kept watching, looking at him and I'm going, I, I think I know that guy. You yeah. knew the body shape. Yeah, yeah. And then the girl came and she says, oh, Paul, come through. And, he, and then I realised, but it was too late because he had already got up, but I, I thought... He was in deep thought, you know. Yeah. And then I went off and toured with Circus Oz as I was getting onto the plane to go to the UK. I, we got the news that he'd passed on, and I'm going. That was such a and I and I and it always takes me back to that point at yeah. the uh, St Kilda Baths because that was only probably a week or so before. Yeah, it was because I know we came off a regional tour and we were preparing to go to London, and it was during that. You know, just those downtime yeah. period, and and I just was so 
rooted from uh, doing regional tours, setting up tents and doing, doing all that. Yeah. It was hard work, mate. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and, and I was, uh, yeah, and I went and had a massage and then, you know, yeah, it's interesting how things can trigger, you know, your, your thought processes, you know, take you to a point and stuff, yeah. you know. Yeah, because he, um, he was in and out of Woodstock a lot. He was. But then he had his own rehearsal. Oh, he had his own space, didn't he? Remember that house he had? And yeah, he had that's the... right. And, and did he buy that other MCI we got from Queensland, from that Christian television place that only had two channels ever used on it? <laughs> no, that wasn't from, from the Christian place in Queensland. That brown, the dark brown MCI. Oh, yes, 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 yeah. But we never used that. No, we didn't. And that was a shame because it that was gorgeous. it was great. It was perfect for what we needed. It, that, I don't know why we never put that in as a mainstay. I don't know either because it had the standard EQ. Is that right? And it was the model after the one we had, which Harrison didn't design. Right. So Harrison That was left. a Sony. Actually, that was a Sony right. console, if I remember yeah. correctly. Yeah. That's right. So Harrison had left and formed... Harrison Consoles mm. in Nashville. Mm. But that one we had, Neil Young's old one, that was the last Was that Neil Young's old? Designed, uh, yeah, designed right. by Harrison. Yeah, right. Was that Neil Young's desk? That came out of Florida. Yeah, apparently. yeah. no, it did because I remember I, I yeah. had to research and, f and find uh, parts for that <laughs> yeah. desk. Well, the top end had been tweaked. Or the yeah, EQ that's one, right. But the preamps were massive. You could drive a truck into Yeah. It. Because the EQ had a resistor that they told me they uh, soldered a resistor on the top end, so the EQ became more sweeter in in its sound. You yeah. know, so you it, we A beat it. Des and I A beat it once when he was doing his maintenance, and he because he's the one who worked it out because we had no idea what they'd done to the top end. Yeah. And he said these what ones you got are fantastic. He goes, they're much better than he goes. Just everything about it, they're better strips so he goes i'll put them at the beginning, beginning yeah, right. and leave the old ones to the end you know joe used to always freak out because we could never change the numbers on the buttons <laughs> so he'd come in and he'd go what how come the channels go one five three <laughs> twenty four i go because that one sounds really good yeah that's <laughs> and i'd move all the channel strips around so so how did you get involved with woodstock because um like i said at that early stage you weren't involved you no, became i i helped I helped run some cables and stuff when they were first doing all that stuff and then they put the Mackie in. Yeah, that's right. We were with... The Sorrows were with Sony and we had a falling out because we were meant to go to Europe to tour because Ain't Love the Strangest Thing went nuts. Yeah. It's like high rotation on 20 stations just around Paris alone. Yeah, right. Um... But of course, we had we had like a I think we we're running a nine piece version of the Sorrows, mm. maybe even in an eleven piece. It was it was an orchestra. Mm. The girls, Licker and Vinda, yeah, they affectionately left. known. Uh, Michael Barker was still playing percussion. Yeah. So it was the whole lineup, you know, two guitarists, yeah, you know, Wayne, real yeah. guitarist. No yeah. offense, Joe, but you know, um, and Sony wanted Joe to fund some of the airfare or something because it was going to cost it was going to cost as much to fly us around Europe for a 12 week tour as it was to get us to Europe because there were so many of us and mm. Joe said I'm not putting any money in you you're the record company yeah oh this is the story I got anyway yeah someone young at Sony who said well if if you're not going to put any money in I'll I'll pull the pin and Joe Played the game and said, go ahead, pull the pin. She did. Yeah. Then I believe she got ousted. But by then, Joe Too didn't late. want to know anything about it. But mm. we, I, I had a farewell party and everything before <laughs> going to Europe because I was going to stay and just yeah, hang right. out and play jazz. Wow. Okay. And come back. The old man's, you know, dad passed last year. But yeah. when, you know, one of the things dad said to me was, you know, if you ever go to Europe, make sure you buy a return ticket. Yeah. So you can be on, you know. Your last legs financially, yeah. but you can still get home if you That's need to. That's it. Good advice. So, yeah, it was good advice. He always had good advice. Mm. But yeah, we never, we never, got, we never went. Yeah, because that was a strange time. Because uh, it was a transition, wasn't it? it? Musically in Australia, mm. we were going through a transition stage. The end was coming for Ian Moss, for Joe, for yeah. a lot of those type of acts that had been 
part of Australian music. Um, it was the fabric. Fit, uh, the fabric of it, you know, yeah. from the mid-70s right up until the early 90s. And All then the there was through. that change, you know, where it became – where like labels like Sony were going through their um, divisions and they were going through a whole range of um, – Well, let's not forget that before Sony bought CBS that CBS nearly went under mm. worldwide and apparently it was men at work. Yeah, right. They saved their them. sales that saved yeah, them. Right. Yeah, right. So f- just figure that for a moment. Yeah. You know, um, but yeah, that the whole rationale changed. It did. You know, let's. I guess the fundamental thing for anybody is to remember that a record label is there to sell its catalog, and those labels, most of their artists were American or UK artists. So, yes, they were labels in Australia that we were signed to. But as soon as an, a, one of their international artists landed on shore. They got everything and we'd just have to wait. So back then having a record deal was only good if you had someone in the label bat who would go to you. bat for you. Yeah, that's you it. Because otherwise you just you joined die. the stable and sat there. Yeah, that's right. Which a lot of bands did. You, you know, it's the first point to get the record deal and you get all excited, I guess, and then it's yeah. the second point to go... Because you would notice that in record stores where you'll see all the paraphernalia of one band and you've got the same release on the same day and there's nothing on you. Yeah. And you go you've got in, a mobile you, in the corner. <laughs> you know, little square, yeah, you know. That's right. <laughs> and I remember um, uh, how Joe used to oh, – I don't know if I should say this, but anyway, but I know, I know in the, <laughs> in, in the, in the yeah. mid-'80s um, when I was – I just turned 17 and I had my – I had a girlfriend at that stage and a couple of mates and Joe said, here's, here's a couple of grand – Get a couple of your mates, go into the Brashes and Allens in the city. Buy the hell out of this. And buy country, it was country girls, right? Yeah, right. And um, so we went on the train and tram and I gave them all a couple of hundred bucks and I just said, don't use your name, just use any name, you know. Yeah. We were so tired by the time, because we went to all these different- All the charting all, stores. All the charting stores, right? Yeah. And I was so tired by the end of it because I had to keep tabs on the money and all that sort of stuff. And we had all these records, right? And what did you do with the record? <laughs> no. <laughs> Went back into Joe's. Yeah, collection, I guess. Um, I was going to say boot. Yeah, car. boot. Yeah, probably. Yeah. He probably then resold them, you know. Yeah. But then that didn't do anything for his, his uh, charting situation. didn't get that didn't get the didn't. We used to do I, – I did all those shopping centre gigs. Um, I could be mistaken, but I think I'm right. Joe was the first Australian artist to play in stores, in shopping centres. Yeah, right. Record stores. Uh, or it's shopping centres. We do like a concert in the main, in the main section oh, of yeah. some place in Blacktown, you know. Yeah. Um, and then you'd go to the record store yeah. for signings. That's it. Smart idea. And we'd push whatever the latest release was mm. up into the top 30 at least in the first week. Mm. But we, they were nuts. Yeah, but that was a different time again because he had already had, had – given the Black Sorrows a big profile and so yes, it, it wasn't sure. – I'm talking about when the Black Sorrows had just started. They were like, you know, he was trying to kick it off. But well, that was after Spirit, wasn't that it? That was after the Spirit label, yeah. And, that was, again, that was an interesting time because it's like he sometimes has said in interviews where no one wanted to know but he's still stuck in there and, um, you know, and it's, that's a that period and it's the same sort of period what you would have experienced that's when right. – uh, you were with him in the mid nineties, you know. Well, it, I'd met him in the in the mid sort of mid eighties yeah. when he produced Man Friday, Man Friday's first album, mm. and it was because Ray Pereira, myself, Jerome, and Kelvin Speldewind were doing that Spirit label mm. shows with him. Yeah, um, and we and then we said, you know, we'd be great, you know. For you to produce the record, I didn't like the mixes. Yeah, right. I went and remixed everything with Michael Letho. Did you? Yeah, Joe didn't use any reverb or anything, and he goes, "No, no, you want to be honest." I go, "Man, it's, it's a nine. It's you've missed the sound." So yeah, but you couldn't give it a big '80s sound. It wasn't the type no, of music. No, it wasn't about a big '80s sound. But you know, you needed to have some some effects on it. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you got you got really upset with me. I've gone. That's all right. So, yeah, the mixes were who, Michael who Letho mixed and them? mine. Who, who mixed Michael and I did. Yeah, but before that, who who was mixing it? 
joded with somebody, someone in the in their house or something. Well, we, I did a lot of it at Richmond Recorders. Yeah, right. That old place. Okay. Before Tim Stobart went to jail for <laughs> selling go kart, did he? Well, he just didn't rock up one day. Yeah, right. Mind you, that was one of the few studios in Melbourne with a fair light. Yeah, right. Now we know how, how he got he it. Got the fair light. <laughs> So that the Fairlight, because that was before my time. What was that? That was a... Um, so that's a computer music instrument. Yeah, right. I was really lucky to work as a consultant to Fairlight in 1983. Yeah, right. So they'd released... Peter Vogel had released the, the CMI, so the world's first sampling music instrument. Um, Herbie Hancock bought one. Nick Rhodes... From Duran Duran bought one, mm. and that shaped their whole sound. Yeah, but what was you know? it exactly? Was it? It a- was a sequencer, an eight track, eight track sequencer, and eight voice sampling so you would, computer. So you would use a keyboard to control it. Yep, had a computer, had a touch screen with you know a pen. Yeah, right. So you can computer. notate it. You could notate by putting it in yeah, step right. time into the sequencer. Yep. Wow. So was that a very lengthy progress Massive. process? It took forever. The samples were still on the old five and a half inch super floppy, oh, wow. floppy disks, Shit. which what what do they hold five hundred and twelve yeah. kilobytes or something? And it'd take, you know, thirty seconds to load a trumpet sample. Yeah, right. Beep. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. you and you used that for some of Joe's stuff, did you? I used that for some of the Man Friday. Okay, great. Stuff. Great. Along with a Lindrum. Mm-hmm. Um, I had the first Yamaha DX7 in Australia because I got my mate to buy it in Hong Kong on his way back from India. Yeah, right. Because we were still waiting for them to get released. Oh, here. they weren't released. I, I don't had know a- why we were late on the release track, but yeah, they oh. were in Hong Kong. So yeah, he bought it in Hong Kong for me, and I started using that with Man Friday. Um, but what I worked with Fairlight on was called the Voice Tracker. So that's the world's first pitch. To MIDI converter. Yeah, right. So I'd plug the trumpet into it and then I could trigger off my DX7 and all my other synths playing string pads behind the trumpet. Fantastic. And we're doing that in 1983, 84. Yeah, that was... We start the show with that and people just go, what's this? Oh, you do it live? I do it live. Wow. And I and I sent MIDI down the multi-core. Yeah. So that the front of house effects rack actually changed... Each time I changed the patches wow. on, the, on the Yamaha, but wow. we made a uh, an XLR. But what was control? It. What was in the middle of it to control it? So from MIDI to audio, uh, MIDI just uses three pins. Yeah, of the five. Oh, it was one Did, of those old DIN plugs. No, I just I just made two XLR to MIDI cables. Yeah, right. And plugged it straight into the straight multi-core. In, oh, wow. Okay. And it, we and you never had any problems. Never dropped out, nothing? No? no, it had a delay of a, each sort of, I don't know, probably about 30 metres of multi-core. I had to put it in probably about a sixteenth before yeah, right. I wanted it to change. Yeah, okay. So the front of house engineer went, hey, look, automation. <laughs> so the reverbs and delays would just change, change the program. for each song. Yeah. Wow. So in that early 80s period, or that mid-80s period, you were working with uh, Kate Sobrano. For a little while. And that was during her, her her time, right? That was when she was really big. That was after Brave. Well, no, it was just before Brave. Right. Actually. But um, to cut a long story short, I did all the rehearsals with Kate and I was incredibly frustrated trying to get people just to come to rehearsals and all the rest of it. It was quite a – to be honest, it was a bit of a joke. Were they getting paid for the rehearsals? Yeah, we were. Yeah. But I'd be there at 10 in the morning and we'd be lucky to start rehearsal at midday or one. Yeah, right. So after three weeks of that, I think we had five songs ready yeah. and I'm going, this is a joke. Mm. Um, and my first manager, Draw Arez, who of course had IDs and then ran the Prince, uh, Prince of Wales music room, he said, well, if you if you – put all your time into strumpet, I'll, I'll manage it. And uh, and so I said to Kate, if this is how it's going to be, I'm, I'm jumping off. Mm. And Kate and I were, were close friends 
for quite a long time before that. Mm-hmm. So I know she, uh, I know she was a bit personally upset by that. But I'm, I'm, I'm almost certain she would look back and go, "Yep, I totally get why you did it." Yeah, because I, I wanted to get work done. Yeah, that's it. You know, I've always, um, I've always worked hard. Mm. You got to. Yeah. Uh, and I never had anything. Never really had anything given. Mm. I always had to earn it. Yeah, totally. It was a good way to. It was a good way to learn that. Yeah. And you know, once again, I talk about advice we get from our parents. But you know, the old man saying to me, you know, you, you want to choose to be a musician. The world doesn't owe you anything. Yeah. You better make it work for yourself. Yeah, you know? that's right. But then you know, you practice hard. And then I had people like Randy Bourquay, mm. give me a break, you yeah. know. Remember he said to me, I'll pay you for three gigs a week and if we lose, you know, if we don't get people to that gig, I'll still pay you. Fantastic. So I, I was making all of 300 bucks a week and I went back to mum and dad and said, I'm moving out. I thought I'd But that was good it. money back then. It was fantastic money. My rent was only 60 yeah, bucks. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like yeah. as far as living standards were... What a life! I, I mean, was, you I was were doing playing. Eight gigs a week. Yeah, that's it. You were playing. You were playing great social asses off, and you were having a great social life. And you I were was mixing, playing you know, with Man Friday yeah. then towards the end of that, and then doing bits and pieces with Joe. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Look, it was an incredible time because because gigs were still a thing. Yeah. You know, music was still a, a central form of entertainment. Entertainment. Yeah, it was. Or release. Yeah. Or escape, whatever yeah. reason people went to it for. Yeah. Um, and that was by far the most prolific time, not just in Melbourne but in Australia for oh, bands. Yeah. Totally. You know? you know, and that classic battle between Sydney and Melbourne, mm. there were some great bands coming out of Sydney oh, as yeah. well. Totally. Um, I mean, it was just yeah. a flurry of great musicians, you know. It's such a creative time, yeah. I guess. Because there was an audience that prepared right. to go out and pay five bucks to yeah. hear original music. I mean, I remember you know? when I my, one of my when I was seventeen, I went to Billboards. Do you remember Russell Street? Uh, do you remember that guy Ugly who used to run it? Oh. He was there for a long, long time. I remember the name, but anyway, I can't put a face. Yeah. Maybe it's because it was ugly. I've blocked it out. <laughs> anyway, so he used to <laughs> he let, he knew I was underage, and he said, "Go in," you know. Yeah, and. Um, and I remember you, for five bucks, you'd get a meal. You can go and get you know, the, the choice between chicken and lamb and with veggies and potatoes. <laughs> so you'd have a meal and then you'd have some beers and then, you know, Liquid Engineers. Do you remember that band? Yeah. They played and they were a massive band because Virgil Donati was playing drums with them back then. Man, he would have been like 18 or something. No, he was probably mid-20s okay. by that, that stage. But he already had set up his, uh, like, just massive Massive profile. repertoire, you yeah. know. The Cutters was the other band. I remember the that. Cutters. I it can't was, remember any of their yeah. songs. No, but no, I they weren't the popular. Name. But when yeah. I saw both of those bands, I thought they had that LA sound. When all the larger acts started to tour Australia in the eighties, the first thing they did was freak out at the standard of the support bands. Mm. And I don't know how. And I'm sure you heard stories too. Yeah. That, you know international acts coming to Australia and getting blown off stage yeah. by the support band because we were all out playing every night. Yeah. But uh, but also the problem with support bands, as you well know, back in those days is that if you didn't have the, your engineer mixing, <laughs> they would purposely turn you down. Well, you'd only get so yeah, much so of the much desk. desk. Yeah, You can use that many channels. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And that was a problem because uh, I remember seeing – Brian Ferry, Mick Jagger, a whole heap of them, and there'd be this Australian act, then you go, and everyone would just turn off because you just couldn't hear it. Yeah, right. It was like coming from, you know, a even when we were away. Even when we were supporting larger Australian acts back in the Man Friday days, my road crew, who were fantastic, but, you know, the front of house and the lighting guys, and I won't throw names out there, but they used to go up to the head of production with a bottle of scotch and a bag of pot and say, can we use the whole desk? And they go, sure. Is that right? Yeah. And a, bo- a bottle of scotch and some dope. Yeah. And they'd go, sure. Yeah. Because it, cause it was nothing to do with the band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The band wasn't interested yeah. in hobbling the support. That's band. right. It was always this sort of weird pecking yeah. order. 
the gigs have changed quite dramatically. You know, where um, back in the mid eighties and towards the early nineties, well, a lifetime ago. It is. It's hard I have to, to believe. Keep reminding myself yeah. that I turned sixty in a couple of years. <laughs> it's incredible, and right? I go, it's only when I talk about the past that I realise how fucking long I've been around. Yeah. And then it's, oh, wow. Yeah. Because I still have the same attitude towards it that I I guess I did. 30 years ago. Yeah. And in actual fact, it's been, yeah. when we were together at Woodstock, it's coming up to about 25 years or something, that's, isn't it? That's right. Yeah, I, um, or something yeah, like I, that. I started, like I said to you earlier today when we were chatting, I walked into a studio, I... I started recording when I was 15. Mm. And so it's always been that and playing, of course. You know, I'll never, ever stop. The humility of playing trumpet especially will never cease. Did they ever make a, an electronic trumpet? Oh, Ak- I messed around with one of those wind controllers. Yeah. But Did you ever use that? Oh, as a toy, I played around with it for a bit, but... I know James Morrison messed around with it a bit, but I think he ended up using the saxophone version because it made more sense. Yeah. Uh, musically, that was. But it's always been that and and the audio thing, you know, yeah. and, and I never really got much into the live scene because yeah. it, physically it was nuts, plus I'm gigging. Yeah. You know, why do I want to go out and do more live yeah. sound stuff? So, yeah. so the studio was always... A wonderful attraction and just – and writing songs. It but, all came but, from but, writing songs. But the yeah. studio, from the time we were working in a recording studio to what it is today, it's a far cry, I think, you know. Absolutely. I think it's um, I think it's intriguing that everyone is still chasing a sound that is akin to the equipment we were using. And you can emulate – devices until the cows come home but there's something about putting analog in the signal path that does create a more beautiful width and depth but i'd have to say this my system still my st- system is still a married hybrid system with digital and analog because mm. because i can hear the difference mm. but I, I would i'd argue as well that um because i was talking to um Bill Evans on a podcast. He used to work for Miles. He used to be the sax player for Miles, for Miles days. Yeah. And we were talking about recording, and he said, "Look, I said to him that I think that if you're a great player and you've got four great players playing, and they know their instrument, and they can tune their drum kit and all that, and they know they can record on a tin can. Totally, man. And I swear to God. And if you didn't, if that that, for instance, if they went out and recorded in a tin can <laughs> and it had." Uh, Apple on it or whatever it is, right? Yeah. And then they released the album and they got worldwide sales and they made a bunch of money and it became a hit. And all these audio people were going, what kick drum did you use? Apple. <laughs> and all of yeah. a sudden that, that that microphone, whatever it is, they'll go and buy buy by the tons because they believe that it's the microphone, but it's not. No, it's, it's not the, the desk. With the gear. It's the people with the gear. Yeah, it's the people behind the gear, yeah. Look, absolutely, and I think, you know, you and I were blessed in early days of Woodstock, but for me that whole studio period before working for Joe yeah. as an engineer, obviously working for Joe as a musician, but um, that whole era of recording, you know, we're in the, we're in the studio two and three times a week, yeah, doing horn sections or solos for somebody, mm. um, and it it became really apparent because you'd be in the same studio a couple of times a week, and the only thing that was changing was the engineer, mm. and you go, Friday, <laughs> Friday's guy sounds great, yeah, whoever that cat is on Tuesday yeah. is different, is El Stinko, yeah. you know. And it was always – that's what started to intrigue me. We're using the same gear, yeah. same mics. Why it's does the Friday's cat sound so much better? It's the players. You know. That's why. It's the players, man. Look, yeah, there is, there's some engineers that I saw that – like Tony Lash, the guy who worked with the Danny Warhols, I thought he was – some of the stuff he was doing when I assisted him um, – 
was very different to any other engineer that I'd worked with locally and even from people from England because it was the American sort of sound. It wasn't the... Right. And we hadn't worked with many Americans. He was no. he was the only American that came to the studio, I think, from yeah, memory right. for, at that point. And he was doing stuff with compression that I had no idea. I was a bit intrigued by it. I was, what are you doing there? You know, and he explained it to me, draw pictures and stuff. Yeah. And he was very open in his knowledge and stuff. And... Um, and I thought that was just great. And now it's now you can look on YouTube, and anyone's willing to give you that information. Back then, it was a hidden secret. Not not many people wanted to give you away their no, secrets. The you engineers know? that we were working with, and the engineers that I was assisting, were still seeing me as a musician because mm. that's how they'd met me. Yeah. So I just asked questions, yeah. and they still do the yeah. Yeah. Cloak and dagger thing to look around to see <laughs> yeah, if anyone's know. listening. I I'm know going, what the fuck you're doing. Yeah. There's no one here. <laughs> Let me tell you a secret. Yeah. Come, there's no one else here. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, I do this. Yeah. You know, I remember yeah. Mick Wordley yeah. talking about midside on his overheads, yeah. and he never did any of that stuff. He was such a beautiful, yeah. generous man he was. with he his was. knowledge with me. He was. But so many of those engineers, I suppose they didn't quite see me as an engineer, mm. so I wasn't a threat. Mm. Um, but that, because yeah, that old school thought was the only difference was the individual. Yeah, because everyone was using the same sort of gear. Yeah, that's right. But know? but I like I said, I'd have to say that it still comes down to the players and their instrument. That is what's giving. And uh, totally, I do this this unit with my second year students at RMIT, and we call it the Red Door series. And I take them into. It used to be Bennett's Lane when yeah. that was running and if the new one ever opens, we might go back there. But I've been using the Jazz Lab yeah. and they've been so generous. Yeah. Uh, but we go and, and we mic up and record 10 different shows mm. every year. Yeah. And we're not using incredible studio microphones, mm. but we're putting them in a good place yeah. with a decent preamp. Yeah. But you know what? It's the player in yeah. front of the mic. And my students are freaking out when yeah. we get this stuff back to the studio and I just pull it up and I yeah. go, listen to what you captured. Mm. I go, this is why I'm getting you to do it yeah. because you've just heard likely some of the best musicians you're ever going to. I'm not having a go at commercial music, but it's a pretty firm bet that you're going to hear superior musicianship from some of the best jazz players around than you are from oh, yeah, a, totally. a rock band. Yeah, totally. Um, not that some of those cats haven't got phenomenal techniques. Oh, no, that they have. And but that, again... But even in that world, yeah. you know, you, you know, look, if they're really proficient at their rock music or whatever it is, if they're very good at it... All those jazz rock guys that we used to go and hear in the 70s and 80s, they're all now doing speed metal. Yeah, yeah, even that music, if they've come from the basis of jazz yeah. and they've adapted to other music genres, they're going to be monsters because they just have a broader sense of the music pl plateau. You so know? at the end of the day, it could be a 57 on everything. It, and, oh, mate, I use 57s yeah. on – I use Go 57s. For it. That's it. For vocals, you know, for everything. A great singer is going to sound hot through it. And they sound great, you know. Um, it's like these mics. I use these mics for singers. And uh, it's weird because I'll have a uh, an African American woman sing through these, and she sounds incredible. Because that's her tone. That's her tone. And then you put someone local, and they see, and they, and you, and you go, Heck, "What's going on?" And then you put a fifty-seven, <laughs> and it's, they sound better. And it's like it just shows you the microphones only adapt to the tone or quality that they're being given in the first place. In the first place, that's it. Having a quartet of really good players is because you you all start to have that trust in one another. And what are you doing? What are you trusting? You're trusting to take a risk. Mm. So there's that constant thing of risk and trust. Yeah. That, to me, is what sums up what anyone wants to hear in music. That 80s, early 80s period was when a lot of that came to the fore where... Music, music had a purpose. It had a message. Yeah. It, um, you could use it as a vehicle to bring your messages to. I mean, I think one of the main bands was No Fixed Address, who could actually. Totally, but you know, you and know. man, what a drummer! Yeah, like you know, they were a South Australian band. They all came from South Australia, I think. A lot of them. 
I'll be honest, I'm not sure yeah. where all of the, the lads came from. Yeah, they from. all came from South yeah. Australia. But, you know, such a groove yeah. band as well. Well, they're a know. reggae band. It's just so Did awesome. Did you ever perform with them? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So they supported... Did lots of shows. Randy... When I was with Randy and with Man Friday, we did quite a few shows with No Fixed. So um, yeah. were they the support band or were they the main band? No, they'd be the headliner. The headliner, okay. Yeah, absolutely. And how did you... Um, how <laughs> What's did... going on with the dog in the background, <laughs> I man? don't know. There's a somebody patting it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so Randy... What, was Randy African background? Ghanaian. Ghanaian. Yeah. Okay. So he would have been a, a, uh, a minority back then. Totally. There wouldn't have been too many Africans in Australia no, back then. No. Except and for Netta Fields, you know, but she was African-American. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, look, and, and again, that's, you know, where I'd be walking down the street with him and there'd be a comment made from somebody and I'd probably be the one to... Have a go. You know, have a go at him and he'd just go, ignore them, ignore them, you know. But So this is, you know, sadly this is not new. But um, I guess the point being was that music was a vehicle for a message. Yeah. And I never really – that never really changed for me. So the, the original music, whether it be the preachers or whether it be strumpet, um, it was always a story. Yeah. You know, and, and – And you've got to have that. Yeah, and all my, you know, and all my Koori mates and – friends and colleagues that I've worked with, you know, if if their cultures taught me anything, it's the value of story. Yeah. You know, and so yeah. and but you know, it's not just that culture. Most of our oldest living cultures are based on that, aren't they? Mm. Whether it be Celtic or whatever it is. Australian indigenous, it's it's all storytelling. Yeah, I mean when I went to Ethiopia, uh, I saw a different That would have been a blast. Yeah, it was <laughs> And I realised I went. I look. I, I ended up in this folk club. Um, in a what club? A folk club. Oh. So traditional Ethiopian music was played, right? And it was the strangest room because um, it was like an oblong shaped room. And what? That's yeah. a rectangle. Yeah. For, for some of your viewers. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. But what, it's a good word, oblong. Yeah, oblong. <laughs> and, it, and the weird. This is how weird it was, right? It was like a get smart sort of series, right? I walked in. It had the um, – you'd walk through the plastic yes. fly screen stuff. Like my there grandmother's a, house. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it was all tiled. And on the left-hand side was the bar. Yep, just a, a cat the, sitting at a table and it was spirits. Yeah. <laughs> but the weird thing was there was this woman who greeted us and she was half Japanese, half Ethiopian. Wow. And she had the most interesting architecture that I've ever seen in my life, facial architecture. Yeah, right. It was the yeah. very blatant Japanese So those eyes, fine sort of thing. Oh, you're right. But with dark skin. Awesome. But she put on, you know how the uh, Japanese girls put on their white makeup? Oh, right, okay. She had that as like well. Like a pale sort of thing. Like a pale thing. And then she had the lipstick. She was, it was just something that... I've, I was just you had to double take. I had to t- double take. Yeah, because it was outside of the normal what stereotype. It, exactly yeah, right. right. And so um, we sat down, and I'm going. I can hear a bass from somewhere, right? So there's this guy playing, and, I, and I'm hearing this bass, and I'm going, but there's no bass on stage. There's nothing, and there's just this guy playing, and I'm hearing it. And but they were play, they were tapping into the mo. This is where Motown comes from. The rhythm is there in Ethiopia, yeah, right? right? And so the the uh, the backdrop curtain opened up a little bit, and I had a look, and I swear there was a hallway, and it was about two hundred meters. This hallway that led to I don't know what was behind there. There was a guy who had a Leslie speaker. He was about fifty meters down in the hallway, and he had the Fender P bass playing on top of the Leslie speaker. And I'm going, he's the guy playing the bass. <laughs> yeah. And because they timed it, it, by the time the bass travelled to the stage and into the audience, because it was a small area, it wasn't a big area. That's nuts. They could work it. It was weird, right? That That's was the, the weirdest thing. the gorgeous reverb of it. That and was through the, the Leslie. Yeah, yeah. And it was, he, was, he was funking it up, man. He had, the, he had all that. Motown stuff going on and I'm going this is where it's all begun this yeah. is that sound and that's what and then they um, did this um, 
call and reply sort of thing. Yep. And that, again, um, where they just make up words and, and it's like a word off type yeah. of thing. Yeah. And that was really interesting um, just it's experiencing. An, it's an MC battle. It's an MC battle, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah look, the, you know, they're in probably one of the best things other than meeting a group of musicians that I still get to play with today. You know, my, my dear brother, Robbie Burke, goodness me, we, we started playing as a horn section together when we when were 16. Mm. You know, and we're still playing together now. Yeah. Um, awesome. I was his best man or one of his best men. He's going to be one of my best men. You know, that's that's an incredible life time of music. It it's is. It's beautiful. Um, but other than that, the best thing about studying music was to learn about the history of it. Mm. Was to learn where the development of a folk music ripped out of, you know, Africa and flung into America and then how it mm. melted into that. Yeah. How the Mississippi River was integral to carrying music on the riverboats between New Orleans and Chicago via the Illinois River, mm. you know, and then you had the two styles of Early jazz, yeah. you know, the Delta style and then the Chicago style. I like the Delta style. You know. Um, but just to understand that it, it was human traffic. Mm. In every one of those cases, you know, slavery was human traffic mm. and it, and those people carried music and spirit with them. And then the Mississippi on the riverboats that was more human traffic carrying music with them again... You know, this is long before anyone got to hear stuff on a radio. Yeah. Um, so it's important for us to, to hook in with those. You know, look, I'm not religious, but a few years ago went to Memphis and, and got to go to Al Green's church service. Yeah, right. You know, and we're out in the boondocks <laughs> past Elvis's house and there's, there's nothing out there and there's this tabernacle church. We rock up, there's hardly any people there. But then the choir arrives and there's probably about 12 to 16 mostly women in the choir and then the band. And this is a church sermon and uh, and I think he's promoted himself to a bishop or something now. It's not the reverend but he's the bishop, Al Green. But he comes out and he just delivers a, serv- you know, a service. And he's singing... He's singing some of the time. Yeah. He's mostly speaking. Okay. There was one point where he, he said, uh, um, yeah, excuse my accent, he goes, you know, sometimes I just got to leave it in his hands. And then <laughs> someone in the choir goes, leave it in his hands. <laughs> and then the Hammond player goes, yeah, yeah. Oh, how good are the Hammond <laughs> players? Leave it yeah. in his hands. And yeah. I go, am I meant to know this? And, I'm, and I find myself standing up, yeah. clapping hands, going, oh, my God. And what that did for me was draw full circle, not on religion, Mm. but what that spirit was embedded in the blues, in gospel. Yeah, totally. That I fell in love with. Oh, yeah. And I came back playing slightly differently, I think. Oh, yeah. You know, playing the the blues or playing jazz in a bluesier way or... Totally. People in the blues scene would say, what's that sort of jazzy stuff you're playing? I'm going, oh, just... Jazzy stuff, <laughs> and the jazz guys would go, "Oh, you're playing more sort of blues," and I'll go, oh, "I don't know." Yeah, it wasn't always premeditated. Mm. It was a, a feeling, yeah, behind whatever you chose to play. That's it. Yeah, yeah. And you got to run with it. Yeah, you got to trust in it. And you know, I, I again, I totally understand the whole academic approach to music and wanting to investigate and understand and explain but that's just not for me mm. you know but I, you do work in academia so I do um, work in academia but ironically I'm I'm guiding people through audio engineering I'm not I'm not teaching the music. Yeah, so but, it's almost but, like the music has stayed a little bit sacred. Yeah, but that's you important know? for audio engineers to know Absolutely that stuff. I mean, is. without knowing music, it's no. I mean, you might be a very good technician, but how many good technicians have I seen mixing? And unless you've got the feel, yeah, you, you make this. You know what I mean? That's what live is, especially live, totally. because um, 
you know, you can... You've got to be able to respond, respond to what's happening have, there, you know. And give them the vibe because uh, yeah. if you're not giving them the vibe... You can kill it. As you know, because uh, like we were talking earlier, you know that uh, if something's too loud or obnoxious and it's hitting you over the head and you can't feel it, you haven't got time to respond to it. You, no, you, you, you're being repelled yeah. by it, not embraced. Yeah, so that's a very delicate... And I think yeah, music can teach you that. You've got to understand the melodies, the the feel of the music. I mean, I'm lucky enough where I work that I go from contemporary you get the music, the whole gamut, the whole you? gamut. It's fantastic. Everything, it's such you know? a good gig. Man. Yeah, you know, and and I'm I'm not saying this to be a, a smart ass, you know, but you know, I'm I'm very proud of you. Thank you. Because you know, obviously. You were young when we met, yes, and we spent a lot of time growing up together. But to be able to see you develop, yeah, too, you know, that's yeah, it's a long. It's a <laughs> I had the hat on, I tip it. <laughs> I know it's a, it's a, um, I wouldn't, you know, it's a journey. It's man. a journey, yeah, yeah. and it's been a, a very rocky road. And it ain't over yet. No, no, because, yeah. um, it, but it is, isn't it? It's a, you know, you work somewhere for a little while, and you. And that's just part of your life. You think that that's where you're going to stay because it's comfortable and then something kicks you up the ass and you end up... Something comes in and slaps you across the face. And And then you end up changing stuff and uh, you've got to reinvent yourself. You've got to find ways to make it work. You've got to... Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that pushed me more to engineering was having an idiot cross my path and accidentally stabbing me so I lose proper use of my left hand. Mm. So guitar and piano get sort of put off to the side. Fortunately, trumpet survives, but, you know, I'm locked up in plaster and everything like that for three to six yeah. months. What am I going to do? So the first work I did after the accident was in the studio, just engineering. Okay. I wasn't getting paid much when I first started, you know. I was getting paid maybe ten bucks an hour, five. But I think Joe was paying me five dollars an hour. You got, or you got paid. I got paid only by the clients. Yeah. Joe didn't give me a retainer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had to bring in all the work that wanted, I wanted to get. Yeah, paid. that's right. Fortunately, we then put the first digital system in. Yes, if I'm not we mistaken, were the first Melbourne. one. Yeah, we were the first one. I remember the first I don't know time if it we was used in Australia, it. but it was certainly the first one in Melbourne. in Melbourne. Yeah, because I remember the day you used it for the first time, and we'd recorded on. The ADATs and the two-inch tape machine, and we had them synced up. Yep. And then I th- – so we did all the recording on one weekend, and then the following weekend we transferred all the ADAT. Into and, Session 8, and the early version of Pro Tools. Session S, yes, and you were editing the drums, and oh it took – <laughs> I, I thought, oh. Jesus, this is going to be good, isn't it? And then it was like three weeks later, we're still editing. You still know? editing. It was unbelievable. But, Eight tracks at a time. But – um, you know, at the end of the day, it was uh, you learn a lot because you were already going. How do I do this? And you were scratching your head, and we had we had to bring up. Did you design a couple in of times Japan. in Japan? That's right. They didn't have an office here. No, they'd ring back at four in the morning. Yeah, you know. I remember we got the first ADAT bridge. Yes, we did. And yeah. It didn't work. It didn't work. The first one didn't work. Yeah, there was a lot I was of getting machine noise down. Oh yeah, the two optical inputs and going. This isn't right. Mm. I RTFM'd, yeah. read the fucking manual, yeah. and it was still wrong. Yeah. And they went, oh, yeah, sorry, that one doesn't work. Yeah. Your uh, your older brother's nickname for the ADATs, do you remember that? No. The Huskies. The Huskies. Because <laughs> every now and then one member of the team would run, run off in the other direction. <laughs> <laughs> that was the best example oh, no. <laughs> of what those machines did every now and then. Two would go I fast know, forward. I know. One would go, go fast go, rewind, I, and you go, "What?" Yeah. You know, we broke a tape once, and yeah. I had to take it out, tape it together. Yeah. And then I could adjust once to get it to transfer. Yeah. But that juggling that we did. Ah oh, man, that was. I so had my much. heart in my mouth all the time. You know, <laughs> is this going to work? You know. And uh, then when the computer um, hard drives came out, that was the the zip drives and all that sort of stuff. That was, that was another, a fun time. That was another nightmare. You know. You poor bugger, I used to leave you there yeah. after the session and yeah. go, now can you back all that up? Yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. That's okay. Right? You used to back it up on CD at one point. Yeah, CD. Oh, man, was. that was, you know, that was fought with danger, really, you know. Yeah, like, it was pretty crazy. I mean, I remember when I left Woodstock in 99, so I'd spent 95 to 99 pretty much 
just yep. in St Kilda. I didn't go out of St Kilda at all, man. I was just there in St Kilda, right? And I remember I had to go into the city one day in 99 and and it was like unfamiliar territory. <laughs> it was like – it was. It was like I'd yeah. been in this – in, in this, a bubble. In a bubble, exactly. We were, we were in a bubble. And it was only when people came to the studio that we learned what the fuck was going on outside yeah. in the world. Yeah. Do you remember yeah. we had, remember that gas, there was no gas, you couldn't shower, remember that period of time? Oh, oh yes. And, you, the guy, and the, some guy blew up his yeah. restaurant because he brought the LPG tank yeah. in and thought yeah. this is a good idea. <laughs> I remember, you know, because St Kilda was the only place I think you could have a shower in. So yeah. the upstairs um, area where Joe had the shower, the mezzanine, shower, the mezzanine yeah, yeah. I used that. That's where I was having showers. So, uh, yeah. I used to think it was a great idea to stay oh, it was at terrific. the studio yeah. until I stayed there one night. Yeah. And it was so noisy. From the traffic or? Oh, from the the rubbish trucks yeah. bringing those huge bins in because mm. it was just such a big open space. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was very romantic to be yeah. able to wake up and then just walk downstairs oh, yeah. and there's the studio yeah, and yeah. then you do it again yeah. and again and again. again. And you know what? That's that's why I didn't become partners yeah. with him because I'd already had my my testes chained to that console for mm. five years, almost five years, and yeah. I just I realised that if I wanted a break, he and I as studio partners would have to then pay someone else mm. so I could have a break. Yeah. But above all, I wanted to keep my friendship yeah. with him and I have, I've got that. Yeah. So and you're playing with the sorrows again. And we're, and we're playing with the sorrows again. How <laughs> fucking funny is that? <laughs> but yeah. it's changed now, hasn't it, really? Yeah, of course it has. It's but you know what? We got into the van, Robbie... Joey, myself, and we slotted straight back into the same banter, pissing ourselves, laughing, uh, as if 20 years was just a couple of mm. days ago. Because mm. it was 12 years with the sorrows yeah, right. for me, um, which is why I always hate reading but, you know, reviews wh- where they, you know, they suggest that the Horns weren't permanent members. Mm. I, I get what they're suggesting, but the bottom line is for 12 years I did every gig, every promotion, every tour. Mm. Like that's, hello, that's a full-time member if yeah. you're not, yeah. thank you. you know. yeah. Um, but yeah, after 12 years of that, mm. you go, I don't <laughs> want to see another hotel. <laughs> I know. I don't want to go near an airport. Yeah. Plus, you know. Then I, then I had the kids. Yeah, that's right. So that's nice though. The kids are all you grown know, up. 20 and 18, mm. finished high school and now now's my turn again. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Mm. Well, it's been great talking with you, Toc. It's been fun. And uh, good luck with your children and um, your career still and, yeah. um, you know, we're back on. We are indeed. With brother. the sorrows and when you play at Birds, I'll be mixing, so it'll be yeah. great. Yeah, Beatnik Preachers. Good on you, mate. Boom, boom. Must have cast a spell.